man, I know you can't drive 55, <laughs> but it sounds like there's no letting up on the brakes anytime soon. No, I'm, uh, like I said earlier to you, that when I wrote my book and, and when I read it back, my first book uh, read, when I read it back, I just went, wow, like you've worked your whole life, dude. You know, it's like you realize that you just work, 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 work. One project to the next, you know, one band to the next, never taking a break, uh, never taking inventory, never looking back, just nose to the ground. And uh, I decided I had, to, I had to think about that. Is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? Or do I, have I got enough? It's like, well, I don't even know what I got. I don't take inventory. So I decided that, yeah, I like doing it. I like working. I, I, I'm a project guy. I like coming up. <clears throat> creating something and then following it through because I don't like just to create and then ah, next let me find something new I like to see it happen and uh, that's what I'm all about and that's what I'll do the rest of my life you know my wife said when are you going to stop I can't <laughs> it's it's not a sickness either because um, quite honestly I've turned it into a thing that where I help a lot of people and I create a lot of jobs and I my goal now is to really everything I do has a higher purpose. It's to give back, help people, help children, terminally ill children. My biggest, most horrible thing on the planet for any family, anybody has kids. You know, if your child was terminally ill and two years to live, what would you do? And then what if you were running out of money and couldn't even do what you had to do to make their life as good as it could be? So I'm all about that now. So it makes my, it gives my entrepreneurial crazy drive more purpose because uh, I'm not greedy. It's not about money. I got more money than I can ever spend, but I like helping people. So, so now I got a reason to keep working. <laughs> makes me happy. I, I, I'd love to hear that. And I was going to ask you because I mean, you, you've accumulated wealth. So it's, it's about impact here forth. Yeah, impacting people it, in their lives. It is. It's about, you know, what can I do uh, to help? And you go, well, you can, a lot of times you can just write the check. But it's so much better to do to give it personal, make it on a personal level. I believe in charity to be in your backyard, right where you can feel it. You know, you know people in your hometown that need it. I'm not going to send my money over to, you know, I hate to say Africa, use that as an example, but that's who needs the most help, you know, in this world. You know, that's a very starving country. You know, they run out of water, they don't have water. It's horrible. Uh, but I, I feel bad letting somebody have a, a, a homeless person in my backyard, you know, and, and sending money somewhere else. So I like doing it local and going down to the food bank and handing out food and talking to the people. Why are you here? You see a family, a guy, they're dressed nice. They got two or three kids and you're looking at them and you're going, why are you here? And they go, well, you know, I'm a gardener. My wife's a housekeeper and, you know, my truck needs tires and, you know, we're having a hard time making ends meet for our kids going back to school, got to buy books. And, and, and so the food banks really help us because we get a couple meals a, a, a week or a couple meals a month here and it helps us make ends meet. That changed my life. I'm going, oh, man, that's so right on the money. You can really get hands on. So, you know, I'm learning stuff like that, having fun with it. It feels good to give. Let me tell you, I wrote a song called Give so to Live. It's about giving. When you want to feel love, you have to give love. You can't take it. Give me more love. I ain't feeling it. No, you're never going to feel it. You got to give it. And when you give it, un, un, you know, just completely unselfishly, then you go, wow, that felt really good. I want to do that again. And that's that's when the hook goes in and you're like me. You're in the boat filleting. <laughs> so I, I've had a lot of mentors tell me that is always give more than you take and it will come back around to you. Almost like drive impact and yeah. the money will follow. If, at least if, if you drive impact for your customers. Yeah. Yeah. At so, least equal. You know, Sammy, one, one of the, 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 absolutely. One of the focuses uh, uh, of this podcast, we call it the Everyday Warrior, uh, is dissecting uh, high performers and, and how they've lived their lives, the struggles they've gone through. And, and what people get wrong is they probably look at your life and they're like, oh, he's just been blessed which, uh, you know, doing my research on you is, is not the case. Uh, you, you came from a rough upbringing and I want to get into that, but you said something earlier that you just, you just can't stop working. Do you find any joy in accomplishments or do you move past those very quickly into the next project? Oh, I feel tons of joy from accomplishments. That's, that's my little self pat on the back, my little ego thing. That, that makes me go, 
all right, I did it. You know, I, I knew I could do it. And, Cause you know, whenever you do crazy things like me, like starting a tequila company back in 1988, you know, nobody had done it yet. Uh, and, and everyone said, you're crazy. Or building the Cabo Wobble Cantina, you know, 30 some years ago in Mexico, dirt roads, one flight a week down there. Are you crazy? And you hear that and you have people quit working for you for it. Like my accountant quit when I built the Cabo Wobble, my first accountant back then. Uh, she said, you're crazy. I I'm not going to sit here and finance something like this. And it was like about $200,000 is all it was. I was a rock star, you know what I mean? So those people, when you accomplish, that's when you feel like, I'm, I'm so glad I trusted my instincts. I'm so glad I, I, I did it. And it's not to say, see, I told you. I'm not an I told you guy. I'm a guy that for me inside, I'm going, Keep listening to yourself, buddy. You got an angel here. You got one here. Listen to him. And when, you know, this guy's going, don't do it. Don't do it. Maybe don't do it. But not when he or she is saying to you, don't do it. Oh, because there's egos involved. There's jealousy involved. There's, uh, they don't see your vision one, one bit. But your little angels, they, they know what's going on. So, which those angels, that's you listening to yourself. Makes me feel good. So personally for you, Personally for you, if you have conviction about a certain idea, despite naysayers talking about the risk that you're assuming, you're usually the type of guy that's going to, you're just going to run through that wall if necessary. Absolutely. I, I'm the craziest guy. In the world. I, my, if I have a fault, it's I cannot see the downside. I do not see it. When I have a vision of something that drives me to say, I'm going to do that, I see clear to the end of the tunnel. I don't have the, just the little tip of the iceberg. I usually see a bigger, more, I go, no, I can see where this is going. I can see how far it's going to go. I mean, not always, but most of the time I can see way down that road. And it's hard to explain that to people. And I don't like wasting my time doing it. You know, uh, there's a lot of time wasted uh, uh, with ideas. Sometimes people talk them out so much, then they lose interest in the freaking idea. They've told everybody so much. And uh, I learned that later on in life that keep it, keep it in there. And just, you know, if they don't see your vision, yeah, they don't belong in, that, in your world for that project, you know. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I don't see a downside. I mean, I, I'm, it's, it's a fault. You know, I have had s some failures from that, you know, or I didn't see, oh, wow, I didn't realize that would happen. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't realize that could even happen, you know, so. So I want to I want to step back to 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 your upbringing because uh, to say you had a rough childhood I don't know if that <laughs> characterizes it the uh, the best but you grew up poor you were always moving your your father was uh, was from what I read one tough uh, you know man uh, how did some of those experiences shape the person that you are today or shape you to face the adversity that you faced as you came up uh, the ranks within the uh, the rock and roll <clears throat> roll uh, world. Well, Mike, I, I can tell you rock and roll is made for people like me because the the gratitude you get from the fans when you do make it, and even when you're just starting out, you know, you just go out and play in front of people that never heard of you, you feel like somebody up there, you know what I mean? And when you were beaten down your whole life and, and came so poor, embarrassment, you know, with your girlfriend's fathers who wouldn't let me come to their house. I mean, I'm talking before I had a car, you know, I'd walk over to my girlfriend's house, my dad go, Oh, Sammy Hagar, is your father, is that Robert? Yeah, he said, well, get the hell out of my house. <laughs> what did I do? Find out my dad beat the shit out of the guy in a bar, you know what I mean? So <laughs> I'm coming from that place where, you know, you just rock and roll is a great spot to land. So is what made all that thing, that, that embarrassment and the being poor and struggling to, you know, have enough money to, <clears throat> buy a, a new shirt to wear to school the next year, a new pair of shoes, you know, because uh, my mom was poor. We went and picked berries and I think, you know, it's all in my book, but, you know, we, we picked fruit at, 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 in the summer. My whole family, five o'clock in the morning, <clears throat> load up down to Berry Patch with all Hispanics and, and pick berries so I can make $10, you know, in a week or whatever it was to uh, buy a new pair of shoes and a t-shirt, you know. And that stuff is makes... My, my work ethic, I mean, what I do now is nothing compared to that. <laughs> you know, getting your hands all scratched up and then buried and carrying a flat, you know, a little old guy carrying a 
35 pound flat of berries down there and have them put it on the scale and the lady puts her foot under it says oh you're short a little bit you know go back and pick two little baskets she was putting her foot under there lifting it up taking a, a couple ounces off you know what i mean that makes what i do for a living very easy <clears throat> but is what it did is it drove me to want to get out of that and as a teenager the first thing you want to do is get away from it so you go start doing drugs you start partying you start robbing houses or stealing gas, <clears throat> which I did all that, you know, but not proud of it. But, you know, I, I rather than go down that road, music saved me. But during those hard times like that, where I could have went the wrong way, um, I was so determined to get out of that rut. And my friends were going to jail now. Now we're driving cars. My friends are stealing cars, stealing, you know, tires off of cars and selling them and, you know, all this crazy stuff. Uh, and I was doing it. And I thought, man, I do not want to go to jail. I've been lucky so far, you know, so. But I was driven to keep going and not take the easy way out. So I picked up a guitar and I, I never set it down. Would you say that you found music or music found you? Oh, I think music found me. Because uh, I, when I heard The Stones, satisfaction or whatever the first song i forget what it was but one of those songs uh and they hadn't come to america yet i got to see the first american concert at the swing auditorium in san bernardino george babcock from 590 a.m radio brought the stones to town and man that i said i just I, forget it you know i went and, then i went to see eric clapton with cream's first american performance on the west coast at the whiskey and and I went and stole the guitar the next day. I said, I'm gonna, I need a guitar like that. I went and stole it out of a freaking music store. Not proud of that either. But uh, I, I think music found me and I loved it. I, I could sing, I would be with my buddies in a car. We'd drive down to the beach, you know, or something. And, and they'd have the radio on. We'd have the radio on, a bunch of guys in the car. And I'd sing along to every song. And then my buddies get all pissy. They say, man, how do you know all these songs? How do you know the words of these songs? I said, I just know the words. I don't know, you know, I didn't study them. And they'd turn the radio off. Oh, yeah, what about this song? I'd say, hey, you know, what about blah, blah, blah. I'd start singing the song and singing the words. They'd go, man. I mean, it, they weren't pissed off, but, you know, they, they were, they were like, on my ass about it. Like, he's, he's pulling some shit, man. He's got it written down somewhere or whatever, you know. Uh, so I, I, I was geared for music, man. I learned to play guitar like that. I could sing any song immediately. I mean, I could sing any song. I'd sing an Elvis Presley song. I could sing a Frank Sinatra song. I could sing a freaking Beach Boys song, a Beatles song, a, you know. So, yeah, kind of natural. And how much fun was that compared to picking berries? Did, did the vocals? <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> I, I, you know, I never picked berries, but uh, I, I served in uh, special <laughs> operations. That that was tough work. Yeah, uh, my body doesn't miss it. Did did the vocals? come natural to you or or did you have to go through coaching like a lot of singers never, do never i'm thinking about taking vocal lessons now because i just came off a little three week week tour and i was struggling uh a couple nights you know when the weather was wrong we were we were in really cold climate you know like a snowing back in, in uh, new jersey and I, I had a tough time singing from uh the air i mean having the heaters on in the hotel room and in the cars drying me out and then get out in the ice cold and then go up and try to sing so uh, first time in my life I've ever started having a few difficulties. You know, I'm 74, so it's like uh, everybody's been wondering when it was going to happen. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm thinking about seeing a vocal coach and see if there's something I'm doing wrong because, uh, yeah, my throat just was just getting hard to hit the big high notes, and, and uh, I've never had that problem. Yeah, natural singer, completely, completely natural. Se se 70, 74 years young, uh, and remember that. We, we we need you around for uh, decades to come. Oh, I, um, I just start, I just talked to a guy. So nobody's ever gonna. <laughs> I've I've been talking to a guy. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I I won't say his name, but he's an extremely multi billionaire entrepreneur uh, in in so many different areas, and he's in most. It, uh, he's just the sweetest, most wonderful man in the world. Uh, he, you know, money didn't hurt this guy, and he came from the same place as me. He was homeless at one time. They didn't guess who he is. Okay. Uh, and he, he gives so much. He just gives and gives and gives. Well, he told me last week in Texas that he, uh, he goes, we can live to be 125. We were made, you know, put here on this earth by whoever, God, aliens, however you want to put it, to we were 
you know, like programmed to live 125. But because of our diets and because of the smog and the pollution in the world and because of stress and all the things, we, we don't make it anymore, you know what I mean? And, and our heads are fucked up. So who thinks you're gonna, so I decided I wanted to live to be 100, that's what I was telling him. He goes, no, no, 125. And he goes, and if you really do it right now with all the technology, you could probably live to be 150. So I'm saying, okay, fuck it. <laughs> I'm going for it. <laughs> it you know sounds like I'm a saying? challenge to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, no one will ever doubt that that music was your biggest passion. And, and my question to you is, is music still your biggest passion now? Is it still, is it, is that your first love? No, helping people is my first love now. Music is probably second and it's probably would be first if I didn't have the ability to do what I'm doing with giving back. And, um, you know, that's half my business drive is uh, all my beach bar and grills that I own in airports, Maui, Honolulu, Cleveland, and Vegas. That money goes to that community. Uh, all the money goes to those communities right there. Like I said, backyard. We ain't shipping it over to cross country or anything. Every now and then I, I do something else. But when I go on tour, I give back uh, to food banks. I give $2,500 in every city I've played for the last 13 years. That's a lot of cities and a lot of money. And it's good, good, good money. So... Music is kind of like all rolled up in one ball now. And, and I think that's important that when you can put everything together, I don't have to change my hat. You know, I don't have to sit there changing hats all the time and change my mentality. It, it's really about uh, having more businesses that don't stress me out, <laughs> where I have people that can run them, and then giving the money away to other to organizations. And then I go play music for fun, and it gives me a chance to go out and spread uh the love to people, you know, going on stage and playing for 10,000 folks or whatever, not only feels so good to me. I mean, I look at these people. I make, I go out to make people happy. Somebody says, you know, what, what's your goal when you walk out and say this? Oh man, and make people have it. Forget about their troubles for two hours, have the time of their life and hopefully wake up at least even the next morning with a big smile and they say, man, I had an awesome time last night. That's what I'm out there to do. Not go out there and profile and, you know, uh, I don't know. That makes me feel good. <laughs> you know? So it's selfish. See, it's a form I, of I was selfish. talking. <laughs> I, I don't. I, when, when you're doing it to make other people happy, I don't think that's selfish at all. I was, I was talking to a, a, a buddy here in the office uh, who knew, knew this was coming up. And he said, dude, I remember seeing Van Halen in San Antonio in the early 90s. And we had just lost a friend and somehow somebody got the message to, to Sammy uh, when you were with Van Halen and you dedicated a song to that individual. And he said the, the whole stadium just erupted uh, at just the, 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 the fact that you would take time to, to recognize one person. But it's amazing. People remember those concerts for their life. Do you remember Van Halen in 88 uh, here or there? And it's, it's almost like a part of whatever stage they were in life. I mean, that's, that's powerful, man. It is. And, and, and I, I, it's nothing for me. Like, you know, my famous saying is, oh, he's just part of my job. What? Remembering that this guy had a friend and he's in the audience. He was there tonight, had a ticket, a third row, but he died or, or he's in the hospital. I can't go up there and say, hey, man, John was supposed to be here, but John, we, you know, see, I got goosebumps on my legs right from head to toe knowing what that feels like when i do it i can't imagine what it does to the person you know so yeah yeah it's a beautiful thing that's called an exchange of energy that that is just that's what god's all about you know is you know you feel something man i do want to hit so the early days with music this wasn't an overnight success i mean the the first few bands you were in struggled you actually moved back to socal uh, in, uh, in, in 70, shortly after you, you had a child. Um, and then all of a sudden success, uh, started to, uh, to hit. Was there a moment that you hesitated and maybe thought you needed to reassess your goals as it came to music, especially after you had a child? And, and <clears throat> I, I don't know if it was paying the bills at the time. Was there a moment that you, you, uh, you, you maybe double guessed if this was the, uh, the route for you? No, not a chance. I, I said, never see a downside. No. I was on, I'm the luckiest guy in the world too. Like I work really hard. 
uh, for my luck. <laughs> but but um, I was, my wife got pregnant. I was 20 years old. I was working in a nightclub making no money. And all of a sudden I thought, what am I going to do? I got to take her to the hospital. So I go to the hospital to get a checkup for her. She was pregnant, you know. And the doctor says, you know, I mean, the hospital says, you have insurance or no. You know, you have any money? No. <laughs> what are you going to do? The lady goes, go sit down. And I go sit down with my wife. She calls somebody in. They take me in a room. They make me fill out all these papers and they put me on welfare. Next thing I know, I got food stamps. I got a check coming in and I got free medical. And I had no idea about what it was. My mother would never go on welfare. My mother, we went and picked berries. You know what I mean? Uh, she did ironings. We did yard work, whatever we had to do. Um, so uh, it saved me. I mean, it really saved me. I had a, I, my baby, you know, my first son was born. So it allowed me to keep playing music. Otherwise, I would have done something, of course, because I'm a person that does not just slack. You know, I've never been like that. So I would have taken care of business some other kind of way. But I said, man, I'm on welfare. This is swaying. Man, my band's over at my house eating. We got food stamps. You know, we, <laughs> we're eating, baking a big old pot of spaghetti, you know. And, uh, it really saved me. It was, it was a miracle that that happened at that time of my life. So, but then when my wife had the baby, they put, made me see a psychiatrist because, you know, they kept saying, what are you going to do? The, my uh, counselor, whatever, the, whatever you call the person that puts you on welfare and you have to go and do meetings every now and then. <clears throat> How are you doing? You got a job yet? Where are you looking for a job? Well, I'm not looking for a job. I'm a musician. The guy called me Peter Pan. He said, you know, you're ho hopeless. Peter Pan, he's going, you know, go ahead. You're going to raise this kid, your wife on welfare. I mean, he got, man, he belittled me. And I'm sitting there going, oh, man, I got to listen to this. You know, I got long hair and kind of dressed like a, a freak, you know, like a hippie back then. And uh, I ignored it. <laughs> I kept going. And pretty soon I got a real, a real good paying, not a real good paying, but a, a paying a musician job that where I could make enough money to get off welfare. And then... When I remember when Montrose, another crazy situation, I'm jumping around a little bit. I think this was in the, this was 68, 69, 70. Then in 72, yes. almost 73, when I got into Montrose, I was on unemployment from a job that I had, a part-time job that I did, so I could kind of get a little bit of extra money while I was working. It was a, a moonlighting situation. So I was collecting unemployment um, from a, just a little short job I had. And... Uh, the lady goes, oh, OK, you know, you got to fill these papers out for next week or for next month's uh, unemployment. <clears throat> and I went, I said, no, 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 I don't need it. man. I I just got a record deal with Montrose. We got a record deal. They're sending me, no, you got to come in and fill these papers out. And they were trying to give me money. And I said, no, I'm not taking the money. I'm got, I've got money because we got a fifty thousand dollar advance and I got five thousand. We each got five thousand dollars. And the rest went for quick. But it was enough to move into a house, pay, pay the rent, you know, for X amount of time. Long story short, uh, it was just the last minute. I mean, it's my, my I was re-signing up for unemployment, and uh, I got in Montrose. We got a record deal, so I am a lucky son of a gun. There's no question about it. But like I said, I worked hard for my luck. <laughs> so uh, you, you keep saying hard work. I've, I've got to ask this question because I'm not a musician, and, and, and you spent your whole life in, in the industry. Did you outwork the musicians around you? Did you have a, oh, hell yeah. a, a, a stronger work ethic? Were you? Oh, oh yeah. 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 Absolutely. You know, back when the guy would be, everybody would say, hey, you know, let's go out and do this, let's go out and do that. I stayed home with my record player. I was learning Eric Clapton licks. I was learning, you know, songs. I was <clears throat> uh, really honing my craft. And when it came time to get jobs, all these uppity musicians would say, oh, man, I'm not going to go play in that bar and play top 40, man. I'm going to write my own shit. And I'd say, well, I'm not. I'm going to write my own stuff, too. But I need some money. And I go knock on bar doors. And, yeah, I, I, I pushed. I, I never stopped. Once again, same thing. I'd get in my car and drive four hours for a gig. i put my guitar in the back. I heard about it. I'd say they're doing jam sessions in this place in Palm Springs. <clears throat> so round trip would be like four hours from San Bernardino when I lived there in Fontana. And I'd say... Man, I put my guitar in the back. I'm, I'm going down there, man. I'm spending all my money on gas. You go there, sit in the audience and wait. Hey, can I play? Yeah, okay, come on up, man. What do you know? I know Born on the Bayou. Okay, let's do that. And, and everybody's going, hey, that guy's pretty good. You know, and then, I mean, I, I was, uh, yeah, I was a full-time guy. <laughs> and even before that, when, when, it, when everybody, it, it, my, 
when I first got my guitar, when my friends were doing drugs, and then, you know, they'd be saying, hey man, let's go get, you know, let's go get fucked up, let's go get in a fight. Let's go, you know, believe it or not, the guys I used to hang with like to go to the next town over and get in fights. They'd pull into the hamburger stand, a car full of guys, and they'd be like outnumbered 10 to one, and then they'd get out and start choosing people up. And I'd be saying, oh fuck. So I, I would stay home and play my guitar after a while. I said, man, I don't want to feel like doing that tonight. So, you know, I always, music saved my ass, man. And it can save other people. If, if you're interested in music, go, go. Don't, don't ever not do it. Follow, follow your passion. Now, when you get to the level that you are at now in, 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 in Van Halen and Montrose, does that get even worse? I mean, are you guys practicing nonstop or, or does the industry start to pull you away from, from honing the craft? Cause you, you've got to do TV appearances, video appearances. No. Um, what what no, was I, that like trying to maintain that level of performance? You know, honestly going on tour playing in Montrose, we played seven nights a week and we would have played two nights and one, two shows in one night if we could have, but you know, we loved it. I didn't want to do anything else. Uh, that is better than practice any day because you get to practice in front of an audience and you get paid. You know, we weren't getting paid a lot of money by any means, but we were making a living. You know, I, I, I was seeing the light. I was seeing, hey, we're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere. Uh, when I got fired from Montrose, Ronnie fired me right before we were, it looked like we were about to make it. You know, we, we, were, we had two records out. Second record did better than the first even though the first one ended up being, you know, our biggest seller from all time. But uh, it, I thought, oh man, we're gonna make, and Ronnie fires me, you know, we're in Paris. I'm sick as a dog, I got food poisoning and we're pulling up to the only place we ever headlined in our life except Winterland in San Francisco, our hometown, and in Paris. And Ronnie goes, uh, hey, uh, pulls up in the car, he's going, hey, after this show, it's the last, I, I caught the last tango in Paris, he's going, uh, after the show tonight, he's going, I'm going to quit the band. What are you going to do? <laughs> I'm sick. I'm about to shit my pants, you know, and I'm, I'm sick in my stomach. And I go, I guess I'm going to start a new band. I went out and did the last show, got on an airplane, went home. I rolled up my sleeves, called my bass player and the drummer from the band. Said, you guys want to start a band? Yeah. Ronnie quit, right? Then Ronnie comes back, steals my drummer. So I take his little brother. I mean, I... You can't stop. <laughs> you can't stop. I could have been a good Navy SEAL, you know. <laughs> I, I have no doubt. No doubt about no, that. Ain't no quit. We're going to take a. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to realize that. Um, so we're going to take a mid roll break. But before we do, we ask two hard questions. Uh, again, these questions are for the audience to uh, to learn. So first question is, what's the hardest decision you've ever had to make? You know, that's a tough decision. I mean, I don't think I've ever had to make a, a tough decision. You know, I've always said, I know which path I'm going to go. I'm going there. I'm, I'm there. I remember when I was 21, sitting on a guy's couch, my pregnant wife sleeping in a chair next to me. And I was sleeping on the floor in a couch with two other band members. And we were talking because we were trying to get a job in San Francisco. And we were talking. And... Everyone was saying, here's what I want to do, man. I want to do this, I want to do that. I was saying, for some reason, I had this visual of a high road and a low road. And I thought, I could go this high road where I could be about money and really focus on things. But I swear to you, I had nothing in my head. I said, I want to be with the people. I don't want to be, I almost related it to, God, it was such a weird thing. It was just like a, like a psychedelic experience. I decided... I was going to go the way of the people. I was going to go the way of Jesus. You know what I mean? I was going to say, I, I'm going to do everything I can do to help people. And I don't want to do anything wrong. I, and it's like, I never want to fuck anybody over. You know what I mean? These other guys talking, man, we can do this. We got, and we couldn't do shit, but I made that decision. Maybe that was a tough decision because I had nothing. And I decided I was okay with it until something was good going to happen. And it was like a, a faith, a weird faith thing. Not, it wasn't about Jesus. I just used that as an example you know, chose to walk the earth and help people and hey, deal with it. You know what I mean? So that may, maybe that. that. That That's a damn good uh, answer. Second one is biggest regret in your life. The, the one wish you or, or the one you wish you could go back and change maybe uh, the, the outcomes. <clears throat> no regrets because where I ended up 
is where I wanted to be, and it's much more than I ever wanted to be. So absolutely, man. They you know, getting my ass kicked a couple of times. That shit was good for me. <laughs> no regrets. I'd do it again if I had to. That's for sure. Amen. I would go. Yeah. Okay. A then we're on. Amen. Yeah. Woo! You gave me goosebumps. A there they are. Yeah. Every every step has brought you here. Good. That's right. Okay. Well, guys, we're going to take a uh, a quick break, and we will be right back. And we're back with Sammy Hagar, the Red yes, Rocker. we are. Uh, we guys, are back. you've got to listen to the first part. <laughs> All right. So, Sammy, we, we, we covered uh, music, what's brought you here. Man, how many, uh, how many companies and foundations do you have right now? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm running through the list. It seems like 10 to 15. I don't know. I really don't. I, I don't. Take inventory. I have a Hagar Family Foundation, which is our, my giving thing. I don't accept money. People are always trying to send me money, and I'm going, no, 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 no. I'm not going to touch your money. I have a foundation so that when I give a dollar, it goes directly. I don't have to pay 50% in taxes. It all goes directly to what I want to do. That's why I started a foundation. It's wonderful um, if you're a giver. <laughs> so it's what I do. When I give, I, my way is, I, like I say, I start a business. I use the money to give. Uh, you come to my business. Make sure my business is successful. Buy my T-shirts, buy my you know tickets to the show. I will do the giving. Don't worry. You know what I mean. Uh, so my fans, I don't ask them to send me money. And and people that uh, go on the internet and say, hey, you know, they pretend to be me and say, hey, send some money to this and for that. I would take those people and whip their ass so bad if I get my hands on them for trying to con my fans. My fans know I don't take their money. I take buy my tickets, buy my T-shirts, buy my booze. You know, come to my restaurants, all that stuff, and let me do the giving. You know. You people just enjoy yourselves. Uh, so that's my system. And uh, I got, you know, Beach Bar Rum. I got Sammy's Beach Bar Cocktails only in Texas, California, and Nevada, coming to Florida soon. There's the rum. My cocktails are made from sparkling rum. The you know, That's world-class rum. My cocktails are made from that. And, and they're delicious. They're better than all that stuff out there. And I'm telling you, they are. That's why I made it. Everyone says, why don't you make wine? I'm saying, because I can't outdo a Romani Conte or Vegas Sicilia's or, you know, Mouton Racha, my favorite wines. I can't do it, but I can outdo those damn cocktails you're drinking. I can tell you that. And I can make better rum and I can make better tequila. So, you know, that's what I do. So my tequila, I think, is the best in the world. I think my rum's the best in the world. And I know my cocktails are the best in the world because I tried every one of them dogs out there. But <clears throat> that's why I got into business. Everyone says, why are you doing this one? I said, because I can do something better. You know, it's like elevated. So how did you sort of get this passion in, in spirits? How, how did you feel that, you know, you had a taste for which rum was better, what tequila is better? I mean, what, what really drove you? Because it seems like you fo you've, you've really done a niche focus on this, you know, wine, spirits, uh, alcohol uh, industry, and you, you've, you've crushed it. I mean, Cabo Wabo tequila, you sold that back in 2008, and then you, you've started a few more companies. What was it about spirits that just drove well, you into that, that industry? Uh, when I was growing up in, you know, going to high school, when we weren't supposed to be drinking, you know, for some reason, the store that was easiest for my buddy to go, we had this big heavy set guy, we'd have a big jacket, he'd go into this certain store and he would always steal a bottle of tequila. You know, <laughs> he could get it in there, down his pants, walk around the store, go buy a pack of gum. Whew, we get run, running through the field, oh, we got tequila. And it was rock gut tequila. But... You know, the whole idea of lime and salt when we had a chance to do it, you know, somewhere with that was a ritual. I really loved it. And but I wasn't a drinker. I mean, I would do one or two shots and I would be. No, I couldn't drink more than a whole one beer. I was never a drinker. My dad was an alcoholic. First of all, died in the streets. I uh, I was not a big drinker. So um, when I started Cabo Wabo, I went down to Mexico. This is. 1986 or so, 85. No, first uh, Van Halen, that was a year or two before that, I bought a place, 83. I bought a place in Cabo in 1983, and I went to Jalisco to furnish it. That's what it was, because uh, uh, Guadalajara. And they, my buddy goes, hey, we're right here in the town of Tequila. Let's go to Tequila. Guadalajara is where all the tequila comes from. I said, oh, where? Jalisco, yeah, 45 minutes. Let me show you. I'm going, ah, man, tequila, woo. So he takes me to all these places restaurants and we hang out for a couple of days and stayed there. It's beautiful buying furniture and, and, and I tasted hundred percent agave tequila. This is back in 19, you know, 83, 84. 
Nobody had. Our tequila you and I were drinking had worms in it, had a worm in it. It was mixto, it was not 100% agave, you know, false color, everything about it. So when I tasted real tequila, it blew my mind. I said, holy shit, man, ah, this is going to blow people's mind. I want to build a place where I'm going to, a tequila bar down in Cabo. Guy's going, ah, we'll find a place. Okay, my buddy Jorge still, still runs the place, still my partner. So when I tasted it and when I turned people onto it, they freaked out. Everyone said, oh, I can't drink tequila. Every person I knew, I'd say, hey, what, try this tequila. Eh, I can't drink tequila. Are you crazy? In college, I killed, you know, hug too many toilets. Everyone had the same story. I changed their mind. So when I came out, it was a huge success because it blew everything out of the market. The only other tequila that was 100% agave at that time was Patron. They came out the same year. That's my buddy, you know, John DeGiorio. He, he uh, did, yeah, like this, right? And then they went, bam, because he spent like $10 million on it to get it. And I didn't spend a penny on Cabo Wabo because I'm going, what do you, I don't, how am I going to have a big tequila company? So anyway, I had a palate. And I developed it. And I went down and I, and I made Cabo Wabo as my baby. Uh, so I just decided that when that happened, it was another one of those things that was a miracle. It's a dream I didn't dream, but, but came true uh, beyond my dreams. The type of money that it generated and the success it has. World's number two selling premium tequila at one time, Cabo Wabo. So when I sold it, I realized I had a real good passion for palate, for fine things. So... I, I couldn't make tequila again, so I said, I want to make rum. That's the other one that's under God. Most rums are nasty. You know, white rum, yeah, you know, you got to mix them. Rum's for mixing. So I wanted to make a white rum that was palatable by itself. And I used to call it rum, rum rock. My rum rocks. You could have it on the rocks. So that it just, I've got a palate. My grandfather was a chef. I'm a great chef myself. I'm telling you right now, ask all my chef friends, ask Guy Fieri, he'll tell you. I can cook. I know my way around the kitchen. So I have a palate and a nose. And, um, that's all it takes to make a good product. You know, taste it yourself, get involved. I didn't put my name on something. But, I made, but, I created a brand. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I didn't sign my name to a brand so, like everybody's doing. I created a brand called Cabo Wobble, yes. Santo, Sammy's Beach Bar, Rum. Yeah. That's the difference. So it sounds <laughs> like, you know, the palate is one part of the equation. But you've shown just this unique ability to commercialize things, to, to, to create these brands. Did that come from being in, in, in the rock and roll industry and watching that industry and how to, how to market things, how to commercialize things? Where, where did that, that business acumen that you've clearly uh, sort of uh, developed, where did that come from? Well, it ain't business, it's, it's marketing. <laughs> because business-wise, I'm not a good business yeah. fan. Everyone thinks I am. I make good good products and I make good decisions. But I, as far as running a business, I have, I find a person that can run it before I start a business. I can tell you right now, but you know, the, <clears throat> the marketing side of it, it's just like rock and roll. We used to go to the radio stations and get the DJ to play your record. You know, whether you took a, a you know, brought a hooker in there for him or whether you rolled him a joint or gave him a line of Coke, you know, bring him a bottle of tequila, whatever you had to do to get that DJ's attention back in the old days when they used to have DJs that played your music and they play your record. Well, I said, the tequila, the booze industry is the same way. You got to get to the bartender. So when somebody pulls up to the bar and said, yeah, I'll make a, I have a margarita or I have a shot of tequila. The guy goes, hey, have you tried Santo? Have you tried Cabo Wabo? So I went to work on that. And, and when I went on tour, I invited the bartenders and uh, mixologists to my shows. I invited the salespeople from, that owned various bars in that town to my shows. And I made drinks on stage. <laughs> I had waitresses bring them to me. And that's how I promoted it. It was unique. Uh, it would have cost probably $30 million to launch a brand the way I launched it for $50,000. I never spent another penny. Cabo Wabo for the tequila. That, that sounds like the smart way. So, well, so in, what, in a different life, life <laughs> Sammy Warren Hagar Buff. could have been the ultimate salesperson. <laughs> yeah, I, it's easy to sell something you believe in. And if it's yours, if I put my name on something, I wouldn't be able to convincing. And when people found out that, no, he went and got the bottles, took them down to the, to the, uh, to the farmers and, and had them put their tequila in his bottles and took them back to the Cabo Wabo. That's how I started my first few cases. <clears throat> so when you know when people find out you did that, they realize that you're into it and you're bragging about it because you fucking go, this is the best shit in the world. But Warren Buffett asked me to speak at, at a 
his Warner, Warner Summit one time for 1,100 of his CEOs and presidents of his companies. And I said, when my book came out, and I said, I sat in a room with Warren, I said, Warren, why would you ask me to talk to these people? I'm, I'm intimidated by this crowd. <laughs> I'm gonna have to walk out there and sit with Becky Quick, you know, and she's gonna ask me questions. I mean, this is out of my league. And he goes, no, it ain't. He's going, you think different. He goes, I want these guys to think like you. Uh, you know, he said, you know, you spent $50,000 for, and made a hundred million dollar deal on that within five or six, eight years, and you know, nine, I think it's nine years. And he says, these people need to learn how to do that. <laughs> it was it was quite the the compliment from from Warren. He's going, no, I want the uh, you think out of the box, you know, different. Uh, not not a not a misguided uh, compliment. That's uh, that no, is one compliment, but my, well, my well highest deserved. compliment I've ever had. Um, It, which is the story of my life. Uh, even in the SEAL teams, I was always over my head. We just, I always had great people around me. We figured out a way to, uh, to, to, to win. That's um, creativity. So that's creativity. I, I want to talk about Cabo because that's creativity yeah. and teamwork and, and teamwork, yeah. a high degree of teamwork. Um, so Cabo, is Cabo still your, is that your spot? What was it about Cabo that, that drew you in? Uh, I mean, because Sammy Hagar has become almost synonymous with with you know Cabo San Lu Lucas uh, or Los Cabos, um, and you've actually been uh, inducted as an honorary ambassador. Um, and I asked one person, he's like, he's not an honorary ambassador; he's the shadow governor uh, uh, of Cabos, uh, <laughs> you know, Los Cabos. So, what what, well, what was it about uh, Los Cabos? I, I, it's really hard to explain. It's a magical place. It's where the ocean uh, meets. The desert and my two favorite things. I love the desert because of the tranquil, the spiritual feeling. You feel at night. It's quiet. You know, there's something about the desert. You know, I think anybody will tell you. You get out in the desert by yourself late at night. It's spiritual. <clears throat> the ocean. I got to have a beach. Um, my two favorite things. Hot weather. Mexican food. Mariachi band. You know, tequila. It's like it hit me. I, I went there because Keith Richards got married there. Uh, to Patty Hanson, I don't remember what year it was, but it was before I ever went there. And I saw pictures. And the next year I went and stayed Twin Dolphin, same place, the whole nine yards. And it put a hook in me. I just said, man, I, I, I could live here forever. And I lived down there for one year with our kids. We put them in school and they were what my youngest daughter was in grade, uh, fourth, third or fourth grade. And my youngest daughter was in uh, preschool. And we put them in school for one year. Cold turkey, man. They learned a little Spanish from our housekeepers and stuff, but and from my partners. But they learned how to speak Spanish fluent, and it was the fastest year of my life. I went down there to slow down, and I wake up one morning, Kari, my wife says, "What do you want to do about the kids in school? We're going to have to call, you know, back to Mill Valley. Are we going back to Mill Valley and put the kids back in school?" I said, "What? School?" She goes, "Yeah." And I, I said, we've been here a year? And she said, yeah, I couldn't believe it. I fucking couldn't believe it. I, I'm going, this is the fastest year of my life. I went down there to slow down, and it was accelerated evolution. So that's how magic it is. You're very in the moment. And the moment lives there for me. Everyone, you know, Jimmy Buffett found, you know, the, the keys. That, that was his, his magical enlightening where he wrote, well, I write down there. And I, I think down there. And I, I love my life down there. And having the cobble wobble. So when I want to drive... 30 minutes into town and jump on stage and rock my ass off. I can do it. Go downtown, you know, have some great Mexican food. I love Mexican food. If Mexican food and Italian food, that's all I need. You, you can, you know, I'll eat anything and cook anything. But if I had two things for the rest of my life, it'd be those two. If I only had one, I don't know if I could make that decision. <laughs> I, anyone who tells you they don't like uh, Mexican food, there's there's something off with them right away. Ooh. Uh, I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> so uh, just, uh, I, I, I want to point out, so March 29th, you've got a new book coming out. Um, are, are you excited about this one? It's uh, Sammy Hagar's Cocktail Hits, your 85 personal favorites from the Red Rocker. Uh, g give us a little insight. And again, if you're listening to this, go to Amazon and purchase the book. What, what drove you to write this one? Well, I've been writing this book for 30 years, you know, uh, since I really discovered tequila and had it been in that business, I met so many great bartenders. I, I can't walk into a bar without a bartender saying, hey, dude, you got to try it. I got something I want you to try. 
and I've had some of the best freaking drinks ever made in my entire life. I mean, for anybody, I mean, and I've learned a lot about how to do that, just like cooking. I wrote a cookbook too, because my grandfather, my mother, my, all my chef friends, and that was a few years ago. But this book, it's so hit because the guy that I wrote it with, he really brought it out of me because I said, I don't want to go through this. Writing a book takes time. I mean, you got to work your ass off. So it's a lot of hours, a lot of hours. And you got to make sure it's right. I don't want to put my name on a book and say, hey, here's my book. And put it, I say, I didn't write this fucking book. So this guy said, let me do all the heavy lifting. I'll go to all those bartenders. You don't have to call them up. You don't have to do shit. I'll, you just give me the list of who it is and what drink you had. And, and, and. and I had to just put all this together. He went out and talked to the guys, called them up, got them on the phone, got the recipes. We put them in the book. And then it's my favorite recipes, the way I, the things I've learned from, from mixologists that, that have, you know, always trying to blow my mind with my brands. Even when you when you have a, a tequila brand like Cabo Wabo, the, the, um, my, my distributors have mixologists because they have 50 other, 100, 700 other brands that they, you know, so they got these great guys. And the first thing they do is they say, hey, we got to invent some really great drinks. So I sit down with these guys. So I just had all these notes and I had all these things in my head. And I can shake them up pretty good. I I, I, <laughs> I can uh, mix up some pretty good cocktails. So I had to make the book. But what we did that made it unique, it's not just a cocktail book. It shows you how to throw a certain kind of party. It tells you what you'll need at your bar if you're going to have this kind. You want to throw a tiki party, you know, Hawaii style, like what I did when I lived in Hawaii. You want to use rums and you're going to use all these. It gives you a list of ingredients and a list of everything you need, even how to dress. I took pictures in the book where I would dress the part for that kind of a party. What kind of music to play? It, it's, I give you four, exa five examples on how to throw five different kinds of parties. And uh, you'll never need another cocktail book again. And it'll help you kick your party up in the ass because all my fans expect me to throw parties for them all the time in Cabo and in my restaurants and, in, you know, my tours. Well, someday I ain't going to be around to throw those parties for you. So <laughs> this is my legacy. Learn how to throw your own damn party. <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's, it's Sammy, you, you may have just saved my marriage. <laughs> I, I have no doubt you may have just saved my marriage because my wife says I've got zero taste in anything. I'm just going to follow the uh, the blueprint in your it, book and throw a party. It's and just a manual. Totally, uh, blow her it, out of the water. It's the party manual. <laughs> well, Sammy, I know your time is valuable. And, and so uh, is, it, is it safe to say you guys are mid-tour right now? Because I know the tour yeah. technically kicked no. off. We're just kind of starting. We just went out for three weeks and we're doing a bunch of uh, – uh, I don't know. George Thorogood's going out with me. You know, you want to talk about a booze tour? <laughs> That's going to be a blast. Uh, yeah, we're just doing shows. Got a residency in Vegas. They're all sold out. And Twelve shows. We're doing our last three this weekend, and then we're going to put three more on sale, I think. And then that's it because I got to do the birthday bash in Cabo again this year. Finally, the birthday bash will be back in Cabo. COVID took a bite out of everything, and. Uh, we just try to work around the system. Like you can't stop me. COVID didn't stop me. We we did a, the birthday bash. We went to Catalina and did it on the beach for boats. <laughs> you brought your boat, pull your boat up to the harbor. We played for free on the on the beach, and uh, that was the coolest, one of the coolest things I've ever done. I love doing things that I've never done before. The Circle made a new record. It's called Crazy Times, and with David Cobb, the great producer in uh, Nashville, and it's not a country record, but it's a great record. And uh, we're coming out with that this year. But there's a song in there called Father Time. And it's about my life. It's the best song I ever wrote in my life. I, if I never wrote another song again, as long as I lived, I would say I wrote that song, you know. And uh, there's a line in there saying, when was the last time you did something for the first time? And that's kind of what my, it's the way I live my life now. I say, hey, I've never done that before. Let's go. You know what I mean? Front that line That is how shit. we keep it interesting. That Front is, line that shit. <laughs> well so for the listeners if you want to follow the tour if you want to get tickets go to redrocker.com yeah. I, I know you've got the list of uh concerts uh you know again for the listeners we want to close this close this out with uh with two questions uh first one how will sammy hagar measure his life and if he lived it well um uh, wow well number one i would have to say was it a good life? Was I happy in the end? Was I happy? Yeah. And the answer to that so far is definitely yes. And um, was it worth it? Uh, you know, all the work. 
Yes, absolutely. How many dreams came true? Look, you want to put a, a, a goal on it? How many dreams came true? More than I ever expected. There's a positive. So yes, we're still happy. Uh, how many people did I help? You know, did I do enough? You know what I mean? Like to me, that's going to be the big judgment. Someday it's like, damn it. You know, now I'm here laying here on my deathbed going, I fucking should have. I never did that. And I should have did that. I got to make sure that I complete that list or feel like at least, you know, well, I did all I could. Uh, and did I make a difference? That's for anybody, you know, that's a big deal. I think if I had enough people say you made a difference in my life, which I think I'm doing pretty good on that one, uh, then yeah, that's the way I would measure it. A deep. bunch of that's that's deep. Yeah, and and I'd say you you've knocked all those out of the uh, the park, and that's not a question you have to ask your time. Still, your, your well, I'm still up to soon. bat though, Mike. Mike, I'm still up to bat. I know. <laughs> Whoa, low and inside. <laughs> I I have no doubt in 2040. I will be watching you live in concert. I have no doubt. So, uh, okay. last question. We we all look. You know, you mentioned Warren Buffett, who I, I'm assuming you consider a good friend and, and a mentor on the business side. Uh, well, a lot of people view you as 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 a mentor. So, what are Sammy Hagar's maybe one to three keys to success? Those rules that you've always lived by. Number one. Don't ever fuck anybody. I don't want to get fucked, and I ain't out to fuck nobody. It's all about, okay, win, win, win. win. That's a big rule to me. If you, if I feel that one little inch of, uh-oh, somebody's going to get fucked, I run. I'm out of there quick, number one. Don't ever want to fuck anybody. You have to have a good idea. You have to believe in it. I mean, like, really believe in it, and put 100% of everything you've got available to make it come true. Otherwise, success is tough, man. You know, especially a big, a big, crazy, new, fresh, original idea. Got to believe, make sure it's a good idea. You know, you're not gonna sell a bad idea to nobody. <laughs> and uh, it's really quality and commitment and yeah. And like I'm telling you, keep that rule in your pocket. If uh, don't ever fuck anybody, there's no reason to. You, everybody can win and uh, that'll keep you clean. You can live with yourself. <laughs> I, I, I love that. And uh, Sammy, I couldn't agree. And that one's definitely going in my, in, in my toolbox. I know there's a lot of listeners right now that agree with that. Um, and, and, you know, sadly I've, I've done wrong by some people, but there's still a lot of time for me to go back and, uh, and rectify that, that mistake. But uh, yeah, forgiveness is easy. That's the easiest yeah. job in the world. People don't realize how easy it is to really forget. Your ego won't let you do it. But, you know, I've made mistakes, too. I've gotten headbutts with people. You know, Eddie Van Halen, I look back at some of the times where I could have been. I could have chilled it out, but my ego was saying, oh, yeah, well, fuck you. You know, instead of saying, hey, I love you, man. You know, uh, forgiveness is that's the easiest Powerful. job on the planet. Get out there and do it. man. Well, Sammy, I cannot thank you enough for joining us. Uh, we know you, uh, you've, you've got a lot on the plate over the next uh, few months. We wish you the best of luck, and hopefully we can catch back up with you down the road. Thank you, brother. Thank you.